Hello and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Betty Maynard, and today we have with us Barbara Reagan. Welcome, Barbara, to this series. And as a first uh, question, when did you first come to SMU? I joined the faculty in 1967, and, and, I, and I retired in 1990. Thus, I have a window of 23 years on SMU history with a few glimpses back to previous times. How would you like to focus on your time at SMU? Well, I'd like to focus on the history of the Department of Economics with some comments on University College and on university-wide issues. Okay, then uh, give us a brief history, please, of uh, the Economics Department. Well, from the beginning of SMU, courses in economics were listed. The 1915-16 catalog was the first listing of courses. And the Department of Economics was listed in the next catalog, well, two years later. Across the country, many universities have economics in the School of Business. Many others have it in Arts and Sciences and teach service courses for the Business School. And it's this latter pattern that SMU has had. One of the big changes in the department was when Richard B. Johnson was chair of economics, which he was from 1950 to 1967. SMU decided to offer a few PhD programs. They didn't want to offer a PhD program unless they could have a quality program. And a quality PhD program requires a long time commitment to such a program and a long time program of increased resources. The first PhD program that SMU put in was economics and it was instituted in the fall of 1959. In the late 1980s, two trustees came to me and suggested that it would help in raising money if a Center for Economic Studies that included the Department of Economics was established and if it was named after Richard B. Johnson. They wanted to know if I would object. I was chair of the Economics Department at that time, from 1984 to 1990. I said I wouldn't object, and the trustees proceeded with the new organization. One of the important questions about uh, departments at universities is, where are they housed? And how has the Department of Economics moved over the years you've been here? Well, for many years, the faculty in economics and their staff were located in the basement of Foundren Library. As we joked, it was located below the sewer line. <laughs> okay. Tw twice my office and others were flooded, fortunately with clean water. Yeah. The offices were dark. The entrance was hard to, for students to find, and the location was a real disadvantage. When Ruth Morgan was provost, 1987 to 1993, the old student center 
became available for when a new student center was given to SMU. Two of the largest departments, economics and communication within the School of Arts, were assigned space in the old Humphrey Lee Student Center. The ballroom was left intact for use as needed by various units of the university. Economics had had its departmental graduation in the ballroom in the 19, all through the 1980s because of the large number of majors graduating. The chair of communications and I as chair of economics were asked to work with the architect in remodeling the rest of the old student center for our faculty and staff offices and our graduate students. I thoroughly enjoyed this task, although it was a tight fit to get our faculty of nearly 20 and a staff of about five and some small advising space on the third floor with the ballroom. The graduate students fit more easily in our share of the basement, which was called the first floor. A large cafeteria with its attendant kitchens and two small dining rooms were also left intact on the first floor. The faculty was pleased with the result. We had some light for our first time <laughs> and a recognizable entrance. Uh, the offices were arranged so that the windows, of course, had to stay where they were in the remodeling. So the offices ran between the windows. And each office had a <coughs> desk, a desk chair, a computer, a PC, a blackboard, approximately the same amount of file space, and some books cases, and two visitor chairs, and the window. <laughs> okay. And each faculty member had a choice between two fabrics for upholstery of the office chairs. Uh, let's go a little bit farther back in history, uh, Barbara, and let me ask you, how did you happen to come to SMU in the first place? <coughs> this, this may be a little bit long to explain this, but my husband, Sid Reagan, came to SMU in 1955 as professor of real estate and chair of a real estate department in the business school. Both my husband and I had PhDs in economics from Harvard. In addition, he had a law degree from the University of Texas. After finishing our graduate courses, we went back to Washington, D.C. Now at this point, fate, yeah. <laughs> fate as often happens, intervened. We went to visit my family in San Antonio. Sid went out of town to investigate an offer to join a law firm elsewhere in Texas. I went to a party where I met Sterling Wheeler. He was, or just had been, a vice president of SMU under Willis Tate. Wheeler knew that Dean Lawrence Fleck of the business school wanted to broaden the business school faculty by adding a Texas lawyer and an economist. Wheeler asked me to call my husband and tell him Wheeler wanted him to stop by Dallas on his way back to, S to uh, San Antonio. He did so, and he visited with Willis Estate and Dean Fleck, that was Dean Lawrence Fleck of the business school, who offered him his choice of being head of marketing 
or being the department head of a real estate department. Sid chose real estate. He stayed as department chair for 20 years. He also had a joint appointment as professor of economics until he resigned from economics in about 1967 when I was asked to join the department. He didn't have to resign, but we thought it would be wise if we weren't both in the same department. In the late 1950s, I talked about joining the economics faculty at SMU and was told, no way, <laughs> because there was a nepotism policy that a husband and wife couldn't both be hired by the university. Such a policy was fairly common at that time among yeah. employers, particularly in the South. <laughs> yes. I was advised to apply to other universities in the Metroplex, and I taught in Denton for seven years. The nepotism policy didn't break down and was not abandoned at SMU until the mid-1960s when a math professor wanted to marry the president's secretary. <laughs> Two years later, I was negotiating with the economics department and university college to join the faculty at SMU. Now that's the, the long <laughs> the version, version of it. Uh, of the many roles you've played uh, at SMU, uh, let's go through some of those. For example, university college, which was the concept uh, when you originally came, I think, to SMU. Yes. Tell us a little about that. In the 1960s and beyond, SMU was differentiating its academic product by having all freshmen and all sophomores who were transferring into the school come in through University College. There were several advantages to this. First, <clears throat> they could have centralized advising academic advising until a major was declared. No major was declared until about the middle or the end of the sophomore year. This lag in declaring a major gave flexibility to the students to change their major as they explored different courses and departments in the course of their taking courses. By contrast, universities where freshmen came in declaring a major, the students tended to be locked in to that choice. For one thing, the department's budgets were tied to the number <laughs> of students they had. Yes. And so it was very uh, advantageous for them to hang on to their students. Both students and parents liked the, declare, the delayed period of considering majors, majors and the flexibility of being able to change easily from one field to another. A few courses were, requ were required of all students, most notably Nature of Man. I understand that Anne Early has discussed in this series at some length the nature of man in this oral history, so I won't cover it to, except to say I enjoyed teaching that course when I did, and I thought it was wise to have a basic social science course that all <coughs> SMU students had. 
The policy on curriculum was designed so that each student was to have a few free electives. Some majors, such as engineering, had little room in their curriculum in the standard number of courses required to graduate from the university. And they had little room for university college requirements or for electives. And some engineering faculty fought having to revamp their requirements or existing courses to adapt to the new scheme. Students with high grade point averages were allowed to modify their degree plans. So for the better students, there was a chance to have a little more flexibility. George Dice was an outstanding dean of University College. He was hampered by the university rules that he could not hire a separate faculty. He and the provost had to try to persuade individual faculty and department chairs to provide faculty to teach the university college courses and or serve as academic advisors. Such service was part of their normal teaching load and the rest of their load was in regular departmental courses. <clears throat> Beyond uh, the Nature of Man course, uh, which was, I think, a very interesting uh, innovation at SMU for a number of years, and certainly Dean Zeiss was a master, I don't know that I want to use the, use the word politician, but he certainly was capable of using uh, his resources. But beyond that, uh, over your 23 years at SMU, what other kinds of courses have you taught? Because of funded research contracts or administrative duties for which I had, was awarded course relief, I, some years I only taught one course a semester. I taught macroeconomics which was the introductory course for economic majors, for business majors, or others who used it as an elective. I taught labor economics, which was an advanced course in economics, and this was in my field. Uh, I should put a footnote in that don't, when I say labor economics, don't think of collective bargaining types of courses, which, which the business school had. But labor economics covered supply factors, and supply of labor, demand for labor, and various theories of wages. In the latter years, there was some emphasis on discrimination, either of women or of Minority. racial minorities right. or right. whomsoever. And then I taught an elective course in economics, Economics of Poverty. What I remember most about this course was the semester in which there was a difficulty in the way the computer admission to courses was wired up. <laughs> and instead of holding the class size to about 30, which was the usual maximum, I suddenly found that I had a, a class of over 100. Oh my. <laughs> 
that does mean a different dynamic, doesn't it? It certainly does. Um, in your judgment, uh, Barbara, uh, what are the characteristics of SMU that differentiate it from other universities in this region? I think SMU had and has an unusual dependence on faculty in planning and decisions, uh, decision making beyond the departmental level. This, this has been very advantageous to SMU. In times of crisis or problems, this gave stability to SMU. The SMU has had and does have a strong faculty senate. I was president of the faculty senate in 1981-82, and you were president mm -hmm. along the way somewhere. A couple of years after you, I think. Yeah. Uh, and as part of this, there was a strong committee system of faculty through the faculty senate and or the provost's office. For example, when in 1981-82, when Hans Hillebrand was provost, he wanted to abolish the faculty tenure system. <laughs> After considerable discussion, the faculty senate recommended against this change, and Hillebrand dropped the proposal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you oh. played, excuse me, yes, go ahead. I'm talking just a little more about what, what ways was SMU differentiated from other universities. For most of the period under discussion, SMU had strong contacts with the business community. It was making an advantage out of its location in Dallas. And then after SMU reached a student body size of, oh, say about 8,000, it chose to take further growth in improved quality, not just going on wanting to have more and more and bigger and bigger student bodies. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you've played an integral part in uh, the Women's Symposium, the creation of uh, Emmy Bain, for the uh, education of women for the future, uh, that the leadership roles that they could play, that was sort of, I think, her, her original idea of how she could uh, help in the integration of women <laughs> into the university and society. Um, tell us a little bit about your participation in uh, the development of the Women's Symposium. The Women's Symposium has been a unique feature of out-of-classroom learning for SMU students. And you're right, even to the present time, the overall heading of this is something like education of women for leadership roles, for future leadership roles. Now, this was an annual conference of about one and a half days that was put on each year. It was con conceived and supervised by Emmy Bain, who was years ago Dean of Women, right. and then subsequently 
when they did away with a dean of women and a dean of men, it was in the office. She was housed in the office of the dean of students. From the beginning, these conferences were well attended. The women students planned and ran the program. They invited about three outstanding women speakers a year. And I think the most unusual feature of this conference was that from the beginning, women in, da in the Dallas community were allowed to apply to attend, and they were selected in a way to give diversity to their backgrounds and their fitting into the university and the Dallas community. The students, as well as the women in the community, had to apply to attend. This, this symposium served as a unique forum for discussion of issues important to women, a forum that was simply not available in the Dallas community or anywhere in this area. I was on the advisory committee to these women students every year I was at SMU, and I enjoyed this very much indirectly the conference served to increase the interest of many women students in economics, and it increased, in my view, the enrollment of women in economics courses, mm -hmm. because economics has always been considered an atypical field for women. Yes, it has, hasn't it? Let me add just one thing, because the, the symposium, I think, has been a vital uh, event on this campus. And that is, in, at least in my mind, it brought uh, the young women, the students, and older leadership-type women in the community together. And they could sp kind of spark each other. And I think that was really, to me, one of the, the best aspects of, of the symposium, is that interaction between the older women and the women on campus. I agree. Uh, let's revert a little bit, Barbara, back to uh, the economics department. Uh, <clears throat> and these might be titled sort of dark times for the economics department. Well, we've had some. And I'll speak to one of the most difficult periods when I was on the faculty. In September 1968, C. Jackson Grayson became dean of the School of Business Administration. Grayson, if I may say so, was one of the smoothest promoters I have ever seen. And he was especially adept at promoting himself. <coughs> Very charmingly. <laughs> yes. I think he was dean about five years, Sounds something right. like that. But two of those years, he was in Washington as a czar of price controls, mm -hmm. which was rather ironic, considering that he didn't believe in economics. <laughs> yeah, right. <coughs> Sensitiv sensitivity excuse me, training. Had been a fad. Mm, during that era. I during that well. era yeah. across the, the U.S. Mm -hmm. 
But by the time he came to SMU, it was beginning to fade. Nevertheless, he wanted to stress sensitivity training, and he brought some new faculty in to teach sensitivity courses. Furthermore, Grayson decided that not only should a sensitivity course be offered, but that it should be required of all freshmen. Students were often required to put blindfolds on and crawl around <laughs> on the floor and feel, grope around, feel mm -hmm. of each other in order to become more sensitive to the person they were interacting with. This uh, aspect of the course came in for a lot of jokes and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. criticism by students. <laughs> Next, Grayson did away with nearly all course requirements for a business degree, including economics. Kind of hard for us to conceive of anyone having a business degree. Without a course without in a economics. Course in economics. Yeah. And he insisted, he, Grayson, insisted that students should be able to take anything they wanted to because they knew best what kind of training they needed. So the only required course for a business degree was the sensitivity excuse me, at the freshman level. Economics was considered a rigorous course by many students, and they didn't choose to include it in their personal degree plans. Therefore, our undergraduate enrollment in economics classes fell precipitously. This situation continued until Alan Coleman came as dean in 1976, and economics was, res was restored as required courses for a business degree. The graduate program in economics was also affected by the lowered, lowered enrollment in courses for business students because funding for the department dropped proportionately and decreased funding and it hindered hiring of new professors, offering new courses, and awarding research assistantship to graduate students. So the era of Grayson was indeed <laughs> a nearly total disaster for the economics department. No. Okay, tell us uh, a bit, Barbara, about uh, another of your roles at the university that uh, you were offered while you were vacationing in, of all places, Dubrovnik. In the summer of 1975, when I was on vacation in Dubrovnik, as you say, which is to remind people if they don't remember, Dubrovnik is on the coast of Yugoslavia. I received a cable from President Willis Tate asking me to be an assistant to the president for student academic services with line, with line responsibility for the Office of Admissions, the Registrar, and the Office of Financial Aid. To interface these areas with each other and the rest of the university. Uh, 
at that time, each of those three sections of staff reported to different vice presidents, which made it an awkward administrative burden, and it also disadvantaged the whole product of the university because financial aid needs to talk to the Office of Admissions and vice versa. And the registrar also needed to be tied in with mm -hmm. certain other functions. The emergency request for me to come back from vacation and serve as a special assistant to the President for Student Academic Services. This emergency request, I should note, came about because the head of the Office of Admissions simply walked off in the middle of the summer without completing the fall enrollment of freshmen. I frankly was appalled at this <laughs> unprofessional behavior. Mm -hmm. Not enough incoming students had been recruited. Others had not been notified that they had been accepted at SMU. And the result was a near disaster for a private university that depended largely on tuition income. for their funds. Faculty wanted to increase the standards for admission to SMU, not to lower them simply to get the needed headcount. I accepted Dr. Tate's request and looked forward to a chance to work with him because I thought he was one of the most capable leaders that SMU had had up to that time. And I still think that. Shortly after I reported for duty at this new position, Dr. Zumberg was hired as the next president, and he was expected on campus a year later. A couple of weeks into the semester, he decided if he was going to come to SMU, he might as well come on now at that point. In 1975-76, I was also asked to chair a search committee for a new director of admissions. We found that the director of admissions at Rice University, Bernard Giles, was near retirement and he would be willing to come to SMU to help supervise the staff to build applications for the following year. And, uh, of course, the level of students that Rice accepted is well known. And so we looked to his expertise to help us attract more qualified students. Mm -hmm. I asked Dr. Zumberg for his opinion about hiring Mr. Giles until Mr. Giles retired. Dr. Zumberg was in favor of it because he knew a person at a university in the East who was director of admissions and registrar that he wanted to bring in. And of course there would be a year or two delay until that could be achieved. One of the most ses sensitive issues related to admission is whether athletes, particularly football players, are to be admitted under the same standards and requirements of other students, or whether the standards for their admission are to be lowered. 
As a side note, at that time, Rice University just clearly and openly had special courses for their football players so that they could graduate in spite of having lower uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. Football coaches argued for lower standards for players that they wanted to bring in, and faculty wanted to see the standards maintained. I asked Dr. Zumberg how he wanted to handle this controversy over lowering standards and pointed out to him that the long-standing rule was that the president had the power to admit individual prospects that he felt had special talents but did not otherwise meet our standards. For example, maybe their special talent was being the child of a well-known alum. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> or maybe they had special talents in the field of arts. Mm -hmm. He said that he wanted to have all, all prospective students and their admission judged by the same standards. The coach who dealt with special admissions for athletes argued vigorously for approximately 10 players. I can't remember how many. I held the line. Privately, I kept copies of their records. Later the following summer, after my appointment came to an end, I looked to see, and all these football players were admitted. <laughs> In retrospect, this year of 1975-76, when I officed on the second floor of Perkins Administration Building, was a crack in the glass window for faculty women. The term glass ceiling wasn't in use then, as it is now. In 1989, 12 years later, Ruth Morgan really cracked the glass ceiling when she became provost. Another era, area of interest, Barbara, during your tenure and mine at SMU, there's been a real sort of a tidal change uh, in gender relations in the U.S. and it spread somewhat worldwide. Uh, starting, say, many people give uh, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, uh, the honor of being sort of the cracking of the door <coughs> of, of changes for women both in the, the uh, uh, outside world and in the universities as well. What effect or what were some of the, the manifestations of this new uh, change in, in gender relations? that you noted uh, or participated in uh, on the campus uh, at SMU. You're right, this was a, well many writers call this a social revolution. Right. <coughs> One has called it the major 20th century <laughs> uh, change. And yeah. I, I think it could be. Mm -hmm. And universities were not exempt from effects of this change in society and their view of the roles of women. In about 1971, President Mc, uh, Provost, Provost Neil McFarlane telephoned me and he advised me that SMU he advised me confidentially that SMU was being sued in a class action suit 
along with six or eight other universities. Some of the other universities were scattered. Some were private, some were public. They were scattered, a few in the south, some in the east, some in the northeast, some in the midwest, and some in the west. I never saw the, the wording of this class action suit or the lawyer's response. But I think that the suit was filed by will, that is, Women's Equity Action League. Yeah, I think that's true. Dr. McFarlane asked if I would prepare a study of faculty salaries at SNU to see if women's salaries were markedly at a different level than that of men. I asked him, did he really want to know, in which case I would be glad to undertake it, or did he just want some cover-up language to help the lawyers. He said he wanted a true analysis no matter what the outcome was. I had no idea of what an outcome might be expected. I told him I would do the analysis, but I wanted to, to treat it as a research project. I wanted you from the sociology department to help me. And I wanted him to provide funds to hire a few students to help code and process the data because we were going to be dealing with a, a database of approximately, I don't remember how many, approximately 450 faculty members. <coughs> he agreed. I also asked him to keep news of the suit confidential until we could collect the necessary information for the study. Then he could release it however he wanted to. We hit the project and its few workers and all its papers in some empty attic space <laughs> in Fondren Library. You will remember the, <laughs> the dirty, <laughs> dusty all right. space we were in. <clears throat> Next, the provost sent a letter to all faculty members saying that he wanted to update his files on their background and enclosing a questionnaire that, of course, we provided for him on their publications their university service, their rank, their salary, which they were asked to complete and return to his office. This information was turned over to us, of course. One of our workers was attached to the provost's office but sat at a desk up in our hideaway. And he called all faculty members who didn't return their forms and asked that they complete the files for his records. Some faculty members muttered that this had never been done before when they didn't respond. But we continued to press for them to send in the information. We ended up with about a 99% response rate, which was unheard of in statistical analyses. We set up a separate worksheet for each woman and numbered each. We then set up an identification name and number for the provost to be able to decode the information we provided. 
Then from that point on, all forms, men and women, were identified only by a number. We took all the information on men faculty and re ran a regression analysis with salary as the dependent variable and all the quantifiable data as independent variables. Obviously, some factors such as quality of work could not be quantified. And we recognize that. She's signaling time. Uh, <clears throat> is there some last word, Barbara, on all this is, to me, this is the most important part of all of this. In fact, when you started this uh, on women, uh, Dallas Hall fell down, uh, literally. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the picture over there. Oh, it's uh, <laughs> That's symbolic. <laughs> but over all of your career, which obviously has been uh, a very effective part of uh, the, uh, or should be, of the archives of, uh, at SMU, uh, I think truly, to me, this has been uh, the most effective, which has been your initiative in uh, getting women's equality in terms of salary and positions as well. Could I give you a couple of more seconds uh, to finish up your statement on uh, the uh, women's, uh, the effect of uh, the uh, women's revolution on our university? I interjected right at, as you were uh, talking about how difficult it was to get uh, the faculty members to uh, turn in their or send back uh, their vita, which was most important to us for getting the data to uh, make the uh, analysis. Well, I don't want to take time to give a detailed discussion of how the regression analysis was made, but we entered the data for each woman faculty into an estimating equation for salary to see what a man with her characteristics would have been paid. We then returned these forms and estimates to the provost's office he reviewed them and, as necessary, called in the appropriate dean to ask if there were any reason for such a discrepancy. If, for example, the dean said he'd been trying to freeze out a woman by not giving raises to her because the quality of her work was not satisfactory, then he and the provost could decide whether any salary adjustment was justified. A new salary structure of faculty salaries emerged from this analysis. The increase in salaries for women faculty members ranged from zero to several thousand dollars. The provost's office also established a monitoring commission for the next two years to follow up and see that the policy of equal salaries for men and women faculty members of equal characteristics was followed. This monitoring function was combined with other issues, such as equality of funding for student athletes. The next year, when the Monitoring Commission reviewed such equality issues, they found that the practice time for women athlete, athletic teams was always scheduled at some absurd hour. <laughs> yeah, I remember the swimming team, the girls had to get in 5 o'clock in the morning or something like that. It was, it, was, it, it was really absurd. And they, they had other inequitable choices. A few. A few. A few. A few. They fixed that. Mm -hmm. Amy Bain chaired the commission the first year, and Associate Dean Jim Early chaired it in the second year. 
regarding salaries, many men complained that women had gotten the salary increases the year of our study, and now it was their turn. There was some eroding of the structure of, of salaries developed from the salary analysis. But indeed, much of this structure remained. Certainly, the campus sensitivity to the issues of equality for men and women faculty okay. and students increased dramatically. Go ahead. Other universities began writing SMU's president or provost to ask how SMU had handled the class action suit with regard to faculty pay. The letters for such inquiries were sent to me to answer. The letters became so numerous <laughs> that this became an intolerable burden. And I told Dr. McFarland that I wanted to publish an article that could be referred to to answer the inquiries. He pointed out that I didn't have to have his permission to publish such an article, <laughs> but he thought it was a good idea. Yeah, right. The result was an article entitled Sex Discrimination in Universities, an Approach Through Internal Labor Market Analysis, which was published in the AAUP, American Association of University Professors Bulletin, in March of 1974. And it was written by you and me, as you well remember. And we had a good time doing it. We did. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara. I think this has been a most interesting, exciting excursion through 23, 23 years of a career at SMU, which has been changing as your role has changed over the years. And I hope SMU continues to change in its adoption of equal uh, gender equality. Thanks very much. Thank you.